All right, welcome back. I know folks are still um, filtering in. It's a great sign of a successful meeting, I think, if there's all these great conversations going on um, out in the forum and also in talking to our great uh, poster presenters. Hopefully you all got to speak with one of our presenters um, and trainees to encourage them. The ones I visited were just outstanding. So if you're joining for the first time, we have a really great um, agenda for the afternoon and looking forward um, to being a part of it. Uh, remember to engage with us in social media and then tell me how. <laughs> and if you do, um, please tag us with hashtag Indiana CTSI. Um, for our sessions, we will have these two microphones up in each aisle, as well as a volunteer who will be carrying around the microphone. So just uh, raise your hand, as well as monitoring the chat for those who are joining online. Okay, so to start us off, I would like to introduce Dr. Bernice Pesco Salido, who will be moderating our afternoon session. Uh, Dr. Pesco Salido is a distinguished professor of sociology at Indiana University and founding director of the Indiana Consortium for Mental Health Services Research and the Ursae Family Research Institute that targets research in the sociomedical sciences. And she is truly an incredible advocate on that front, as I've witnessed multiple times with the CTSI and otherwise. Uh, she is an elected member of both the National Academy of Medicine and the Na National Academy of Sciences. Her research broadly uh, focuses on how social networks and culture provide insights into health, illness, and healing phenomena, and more specifically on four areas, stigma, suicide, healthcare use, and healthcare systems. Her concerns have spanned lo local, national, and international questions and problems, primarily targeting mental illness. She does tremendous work. I'd like to welcome Dr. Pesco Salido. Thank you. I'm really honored to have been asked by CTSI leaders to introduce one of the sessions. And I think in particular, this session is so exciting because I think it does represent the future of medicine in terms of partnerships. So as you know, this is called Population to Precision Across the State, looking at that transition. Um, and I will be your moderator today. Um, the, we have three distinguished groups of speakers who will share their innovative research and initiatives aimed at improving health outcomes across Indiana. Each group highlights work that has been done in collaboration between either a faculty or physician researcher and a community member or a patient partner. What we call in mental illness are consumers. Um, each team will present for 30 minutes, um, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. So let me introduce, let's get started, introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Lauren Nephew, Assistant Professor in the Department of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Associate Chair of Health Equity at Indiana University. She will be presenting along with Connie Carroll, who I just met, who has served us in Indiana as a teacher uh, during her life, um, who is a partner and par participant in Dr. Nephew's research on LiverLink, a stakeholder-driven intervention to improve access to curative therapies for liver cancer. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Lauren and Connie. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share with you all some of our work and even more excited um, to have our kind of interview period after my slides uh, with Ms. Connie. So I'm gonna get started. So I'm gonna take you on a journey with me. And so this is the outline for our journey. We will be going through the phases of disparities research. And so disparities research always starts with detecting a disparity, right? You have to define a disparity and identify which marginalized groups are uh, hampered by this disparity. But we don't want to stop there, okay? So the second phase of disparities research is really to understand. Understand the determinants of that disparity at multiple levels, at the patient level, provider, health system level. And then if we're lucky, we get funded and we go on to the third box uh, where we're reducing disparities. And reducing is really where I really am excited to be. Um, and so that's developing interventions that act on those determinants uh, and to improve health equity. 
but you don't get there first. You got to start by detecting. So we're going to start off by talking about um, how we identified this disparity here in Indiana. So I'm going to be speaking mostly today about hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, that's one of the primary liver malignancies. Um, it's largely asymptomatic, unfortunately, um, and that can often lead to late diagnosis in patients. Um, nationally, as you can see in this figure here on the right, um, there's been a long-standing disparity in survival between black and white patients who have this condition. Um, and that disparity is seen here in Indiana. You can see the figures at the bottom of the slide uh, that mortality from liver cancer in Indiana um, is disparate by race with black patients having almost double uh, the mortality of their white counterparts. So we were very interested in understanding um, if this disparity was here, did we, would we see it here uh, in Indiana um, and really what uh, what was driving that disparity. There have been uh, a lot of SEER database research that identified uh, disparity in survival related to the lack of access to curative therapies like surgery, uh, resection, transplant, which is how we cure liver cancer. Um, but the drawback of the SEER database is that we don't have a lot of the confounders. And so there was always this discussion around comorbidity, liver disease severity, uh, the exact stage of the liver cancer. Um, and without really being able to control for those variables, it wasn't always clear if these disparities in access to transplant or resection were true. And so we really wanted to see, one, was this disparity present in Indiana? And then two, would it still be there if we were able to control for some of these very kind of granular um, uh, covariates? And so we, we set out on an ambitious chart review of over 1,000 patients um, here uh, seen at the, in the Indiana University Health System. And what we found was that uh, even on multivariable analysis, controlling for everything that we could think of um, that could be a determinant of access to transplant, uh, the odds ratio for access to transplant and resection was still 0.43 in the comparison between black and white patients. Um, and so you can see that this odds ratio didn't attenuate at all in our univariable and multivariable analysis. And so that led us to believe that there was something else going on other than liver disease severity and comorbidity and cancer stage that was really hampering patients um, um, of color from getting to transplant or resection. We did a small subset analysis of the patients who had really early stage liver cancer. And so we call that within Milan um, criteria um, to see how they differed from white patients who were within Milan criteria to try to understand what the differences were between these groups who actually made it to transplant, uh, who were very early and would have been great candidates. And what we found again was that there was really no difference in their comorbidity. Um, there was really no difference in their age. The difference was really in these health behaviors like substance use and alcohol, and that was really driving the group of black patients um, not being eligible for transplant. And so that really got me to thinking that, you know, I spent this large uh, chunk of time doing this large chart review, trying to understand disease burden and how it may impact access to curative therapies, but I was missing a big piece of the story. So I figure we need to move from just not just detecting this disparity, but really understanding it um, in a deeper way. And I realized before I did that, that I also needed to think about my kind of construct or conceptual framework for how I understand disease. When I was in medical school, which I like to think wasn't that long ago, um, this is how we looked at disease, okay? You have behaviors like drinking, smoking, access, uh, lack of exercise, um, that those things all contribute to your um, comorbidities like liver disease. And then your liver disease gets worse and you develop complications and you die. And so that's a real medical model um, of disease. Um, but as I did this project and I really started to read the literature, you know, I really realized that there's so much that's happening upstream of health behaviors. And while they're very important, um, there are, uh oh, excuse me, um, there are other factors um, that are equally important. And so uh, the medical model of disease that I was taught was relevant, um, but it wasn't the only aspect of why people develop disease. And so the socio ecological model would suggest that. 
the biased beliefs that we have, the policies that we have in our country, our practices, all those things contribute to where we live, where we work, where we grow in our communities. And all those things contribute to people's individual determinants, their socioeconomic status, their education, their literacy, and all of those things drive health behaviors. And so there's a lot that's happening upstream of those comorbidities that I was able to capture from my chart review that we really weren't exploring. So I set out on a mission to try to understand these upstream factors and how they impact access to curative therapies like liver transplant or resection. And so when I first started down this path, I was pretty sure that, you know, healthcare would be better and outcomes would be better if there were just better laws, right? We've just got to fix the laws and people need insurance and all ills will go away. And so I wanted to explore how Medicaid expansion, how it improved uh, liver transplant access to see if this was true. And so this is a figure that looks at, uh, in orange, um, all of uh, the places that did not expand Medicaid. And then in the dark lines and then the dotted lines uh, represent minoritized groups. And you can see that there's just a heavy uh, concentration um, of Black and Hispanic patients within the states that didn't um, expand Medicaid. And so I thought that, you know, I was going to see an expansion of Medicaid and I was going to see that all was well. And that wasn't really the complete story. Um, overall, Medicaid expansion did improve access to transplant for some groups, particularly Hispanic groups um, in those um, um, expand states. But when I looked at black and white patients and subset those patient groups out, there really was no impact of Medicaid expansion on access to liver transplant for that group. And so one of the lessons that I began to learn as we did some other policy work was that policies are necessary, uh, but they are not sufficient. Uh, to improving uh, health outcomes and moving down this pathway of understanding social determinants of health. And so we decided, okay, we've done a little policy work, let's think about neighborhood. Um, I read a lot about the impact of neighborhood and environment on what I call the big diseases, heart disease, breast cancer, um, hypertension. I wasn't really sure if it was going to really play a role um, in our cohort. Uh, but to my surprise, um, it really did. And so we did a retrospective chart review of over 3,000 patients um, with end-stage liver disease and liver cancer at IU. Um, we looked at their census tract level, um, area deprivation, as well as neighborhood poverty to try to understand the relationship between those area the neighborhood um, determinants and the, whether or not they were waitlisted for transplant and whether or not they died um, after or excuse me while waiting for transplant and to my surprise even when we controlled for everything in that circle so controlling for individual determinants like insurance status marital status as a surrogate for social support comorbidity um, this was a chart review so we had a lot of covariates Neighborhood deprivation was still an independent predictor of death. And so, to my surprise, where you live was really important, even for liver cancer, even for liver transplant, which I consider a very kind of niche condition, just telling me the importance of area level determinants um, on access to care and health outcomes. So I didn't want to stop there. We had explored policy. We explored area. Um, I really wanted to understand individual determinants as well, um, because in our models, we saw that things like insurance status and marital status were still significant, even when we controlled for area level deprivation measures like neighborhood poverty. So that told me that there was still something else that was missing at the individual level that I needed to understand before we could develop an intervention. Um, and so we did a, a prospective cohort study, and this was part of my CTSI kale to work <laughs> if I can give a little plug for the CTSI. Um, <laughs> Um, where we enrolled 139 patients with liver cancer, and we did structured, semi-structured interviews with these patients to understand what were their individual barriers to, uh, or their individual social determinants, I should say. And so we grouped these um, into kind of three categories, and this is a modified Levesque conceptual framework. Um, we looked at their ability to perceive, Okay, so their health literacy, their disease specific knowledge, their educational attainment, we looked at their ability to pay and reach, so their employment, their income, their income adequacy, which is a bit different than income, right, and then their ability to engage, um, so substance use, social support, how activated were they to really be involved in their care, and so we looked at all of these determinants in our liver cancer patients. 
And what we found was that black patients um, represented in the black bars had overall um, a higher number of adverse social determinants. And so you can perhaps see that small number on the top of the dark bar was 5.4 compared to their white counterparts at 3.2. Um, and there was important differences which in each domain. So there was a significant difference um, in their health literacy, um, in, excuse me, not in their health literacy, um, in their income, their social support. Um, and those are kind of described in the black bars there um, within each domain of the ability to perceive, reach and pay and engage. Notably, which, what wasn't different between black and white patients with their adherence um, and their activation. Um, and so I think often when I read papers that are describing disparities, I see the list of potential explanations in um, the discussion for those disparities. And I hear, I read adherence and activation is often explanations. And in our cohort, we really didn't find a difference there. The differences were really in insurance and marital status and, um, and some of these other social determinants of health. We went on to try to understand which one of these social determinants, if any, um, predicted transplant or survival. Um, and what we found was there wasn't really one social determinant. It was the cumulative burden. So the cumulative burden of social determinants was associated with transplant, um, which that kind of makes sense, right? The more burdens you stack on someone, the harder it is for them to access a complicated um, piece of care like liver transplantation. Um, and then we found actually that of all the social determinants, health literacy um, was associated with survival in this cohort. Um, and so these were things that we really hadn't expected to necessarily see. And so when developing intervention, we knew that we were gonna have to think about people's literacy and knowledge, and then we're gonna have to think about all of the weight of the social determinants or adverse social determinants that they face um, in trying to access care. So there are disparities interventions that have been successful. Um, and when you look at what has worked, um, we know that multi-level interventions are necessary to improve um, health disparities and to, act, uh, to get towards health equity. Um, we know that interventions need to be cult culturally targeted or at least culturally informed. Um, the team-based care, patient nav that navigation, and working with families are all things that are necessary um, if we're going to develop a successful intervention in this space. And so with that knowledge and what we learned about policy and an area and individual social determinants, um, this was our conceptual model for my K-23 which was that there are things that you bring to the table. Um, these things are important, your, your income, your education, your instrumental support, your disease severity. Um, from within the healthcare system, from where I am though, I may not be able to modify those things, right? You come to the table, I may not be able to put money in your pocket or go back and change your second grade teacher. Um, but what I can do um, is better understand your social determinants like social um, substance use and alcohol use, I can improve your knowledge. The debate, there's still a debate, I think, about whether or not you can improve literacy, but I can improve your knowledge related to liver cancer. I can help you navigate that care better and overcome some of those multiple social determinants. And so our goal was to create this intervention. It was three parts. I'm only really going to talk to you today about the patient level intervention, which is kind of this um, knowledge intervention because of time today with hopes that we would improve people's access to resection or their access to the wait list for liver cancer and liver transplantation. So when developing an intervention, um, I knew that I wanted to bring patients into this um, discussion. Um, I didn't want to just come up with something. And this was a challenge to write an NIH grant where you tell them you don't know what the end is gonna be. Um, that you're going to develop an intervention, but I don't know exactly what it's gonna be because I don't know what patients want. Luckily, it worked out. <laughs> um, and the research jam in our CTSI core here helped us to frame that kind of black box um, so that it sounded reasonable. Um, and so we decided to use human-centered design uh, research methods working with the research jam here. Um, and what's um, 
different from human-centered design research over kind of focus group research is that the stakeholders are involved at the very kind of throughout the whole process and you don't just ask them questions they actually participate in activities and through those activities they often realize unmet needs that they didn't know that they even had if you were to just ask them um, tell me what your barriers are to liver transplantation. And so by working through these activities, um, you learn a lot about what are their barriers to accessing care. So this is the study design for developing that portion of the intervention. We did what we called an explore jam, where we talked to black patients and patients experiencing adverse social determinants of health um, in separate groups. Um, we did, did a co-design session where providers, including physicians, social workers, our transplant coordinators got together, looked at the barriers that patients were facing, and came up with suggestions for interventions. And then we took those intervention suggestions back to the patients to say, hey, what do you think? How do you think we should modify these things? And then we actually took those in interventions to a collaborator at Hopkins so that we could see, is this transferable? Our patients came up with this, but what do patients on the East Coast think? Are they facing completely different adverse social determinants? I won't talk about that today, but surprisingly to me, whether you're in Baltimore or here, many of your barriers are the same. So our methods um, were many, um, and we use journey mapping um, as one method and our activity to participate with patients. Um, a journey map allows patients to understand the moments or to describe the moments that matter most to them from their diagnosis to waitlisting and transplant. And we asked them specifically to talk about their information challenges, um, their healthcare system challenges, as well as their kind of social needs and any other challenges that they wanted to discuss. Um, and this was led by a facilitator. Each patient did this individually, and then they came together and made one big journey map where they were able to kind of play off of each other um, about some of their barriers to accessing care. We also had them do something called group ideation. Um, after we kind of identified barriers, we wanted to know how would you solve this problem um, if you were Apple, <laughs> if you had, you know, unlimited time and money. Um, just give us ideas for what do you think are the solutions to these barriers that you identify. And so we wanted to be able to take those barriers and solutions to providers to develop um, prototypes for an intervention. Analysis, you know, I have a master's in epidemiology, but my um, uh, K-23 career development was to learn some of these more qualitative methods. Um, this was, this has been a, a, a an effort for me <laughs> um, to move into a more qualitative space. Um, and so in analysis, we uh, focus on kind of what is, and then in synthesis, we kind of focus on what could be, and that's, that's the methodology that I've become more comfortable with over the past year. And this is what it looked like um, as we were analyzing kind of quotes from all of these focus groups and kind of putting them together and identifying themes. And I started off with being really shocked and thinking we would never come to any conclusions, but we did. Um, and so these were some of the, the themes um, that um, came from the explore session with the patients from the black and the low SES groups. Um, they overall identified, I would say, four categories of barriers, systemic issues, barriers to information, their overall emotional experience with treatment, um, and then a lot of social determinant of health issues. And so I've highlighted a few quotes that I think are interesting from patients' perspectives and kind of identify or um, are examples of some of these issues that they faced. Um, within distrust of the healthcare system, which was a strong theme. Um, patients said, I kept questioning whether they were really doing what's best for me or just following some protocol. Um, within information, patients said, it was so much information, I felt overwhelmed and couldn't process it all at once. Within their experience of treatment, one patient said, the medication made me feel horrible and I wasn't sure it was worth it. And then within the social determinants of health sphere, one patient said, I constantly worried about how to pay for my treatment and other bills all at the same time. And so these were the kind of overarching barriers that patient identified. And I think that 
I had not realized how large the emotional toll um, of treatment and recovery really was taking on patients in both groups. And so that was really something that we hadn't really set up to deal with actually in our intervention. This is a diagram that compares um, what our black JAM patients said reported over the other JAM with our adverse social determinant of health patients. And many of the themes were the same. So when it came to uh, information and education, both of them said way too much information not given to me when I need it. Um, distrust only came up in our black patient group. Um, and I think given what we know about um, access to our health care um, in kind of distrust more globally around other conditions, this may not be surprising to folks. Um, the emotional burden disease, um, that psychological and emotional concerns was really strong in our black patient group. Um, and then many of the recovery challenges um, were only discussed in our um, adverse social determinant group because many of our black patients had not been through transplant. They were in evaluation, but for various social determinant of health reasons and other reasons, they had never actually made it through the full process. And so that was a limitation of our study in a way, but it also just highlighted the disparity that we knew exists. These are some of the solutions um, that patients came up with um, to the barriers that they identify. Um, and so they told us they want some type of communication, no matter what it is, just to say that the labs are good, um, even if they're normal. They want to know. They want to be involved. Um, they told us that they needed the doctors to have more empathy um, and to be more personable, but not too personal. <laughs> Um, they said that they wanted um, support. This was the major theme. Um, they wanted to speak to a patient who had been to surgery before. They wanted to be a part of groups and hear about what to expect from patients, not from us. They want to help understand the medical terminology. Um, they wanted something to be able to refer back to when they got confused. Um, and so these were some of the things that were high priorities for them um, in terms of things that we needed to work on. So we took those barriers um, as well as um, those solutions uh, back to our providers and we asked them um, to go to work. Um, and so how might we better support patients emotionally because we hadn't thought a lot about that and how might we better communicate information knowing that we couldn't target everything. Those were two themes that seemed to be really on the top of the minds of both patient groups. So we asked the providers to participate in something called brain writing. Um, that's where you really just prioritize the quantity of ideas over the quality, anything that sounds reasonable, not even reasonable, anything um, that comes to mind, they write it. Um, and then you dwindle it down to things that sound more reasonable um, as you go. Um, and so before doing the brain writing, again, the providers were provided with what we had learned from the Explore session to inform um, their discussion. This is not meant for you to really be able to see um, all of the ideas that they came up with, <laughs> um, but just to get an idea for um, just the breadth um, of solutions that providers came up with when they were kind of given this information about patients. Um, and so we were able to take their kind of uh, suggestions and distill this down um, into three potential prototypes. Um, one was a treatment roadmap that really described the process more linearly. linearly. Um, one was a tailored education course um, that really um, gave patients information in more bits and pieces instead of trying to get everything out on the first visit. And then the other um, idea was a peer navigator. How can we help patients to be able to um, get that support they needed? Um, and so these are the three prototypes that providers came up with. We took those prototypes back to patients. Patients didn't love the peer navigator. I was really disappointed. <laughs> um, there were lots of concerns about who they would be matched with. Would this person be the right person? Would this person really be um, wanting to know their medical information? How informed would this person be? Um, and so what we came up with um, based on patient fees back and kind of um, um, some uh, uh, edits to the prototype were a video series. 
um, that really introduced to them um, kind of basics of liver cancer, the treatments, um, and what to expect from recovery after treatment. Patients didn't want to have to read everything. And so having a video to them, something they can refer back to was the feedback we got about the education course. Um, we were going to supplement that with a binder. Some patients very much felt like they wanted something more tangible that they could flip to and write in and highlight. Um, and so in addition to the video, um, we're developing a, a binder with written information as a resource guide. Um, and then they really weren't super excited about the peer navigator, but like the idea of a peer support group better. Um, and so this is coupled with all of this education with a video peer support group um, to try to help patients to really be supported um, through the emotional part of their journey. And they really like this kind of um, edits to our original prototype. So um, with that, I hope that I've uh, convinced you that health equity and health disparities research is a journey um, and that many of us are so excited to be moving from detecting and understanding to really developing interventions with patients, with providers. Um, and if you are, um, under, once you understand those determinants, um, then you can engage with patients and providers to develop solutions. Um, this research has to be pragmatic. Um, you have to sit down and talk to patients. Um, it is not quantitative all the time, and that is okay. Um, it's multidisciplinary, all types of people from communications, from qualitative research, physicians all coming together um, to make this work. It takes a long time, <laughs> uh, but it's worth it. And so I'm very excited um, to talk to you a little bit more uh, with Ms. Connie um, about her uh, role and how she participated um, in our research. So we have 10 minutes for questions and I certainly, I have a million, but um, I certainly wanna open it up to the audience first. Um, if there are people who have uh, questions for Connie or um, for Lauren in terms of uh, this exciting project that they did. Okay, I, the, I feel, what? Can I kick it off? What you I may ask? kick it off, of okay. course. Okay, I'm just gonna ask Ms. Connie to introduce herself and tell us a bit about when she was diagnosed and how you felt when you were diagnosed. The diagnosis itself was probably the scariest thing I've ever had to face in my life. Just, um, just hearing the word cancer was enough to throw me over the edge. Where and how did it all start? One of the big start points was probably 20 years ago. Life had been pretty normal up until that time. Show me a buffet and I'd show you an empty buffet. <laughs> I had bariatric surgery, a ruined white full bypass some 20 years ago. I really think that the liver process, the NASH that I encountered was started back then. That was a life changing incident, not about the weight loss, but about how I had to look at food. Um, my direct beginning of the liver process began with our good old Eskenazi down here, um, a kidney stone that took me to emergency one night. That kidney stone was worked on in surgery that same night, and one of the stones exploded and sent my body into sepsis septic shock. I spent two months in the hospital, a month or more in rehab, and the first full month I was on a ventilator. My family rallied from every place. It was so Fantastic to know that I had the support that I needed. This whole hospital stay and the kidney stone 
then sent me to follow-ups. There's a GI doctor, there's a lung doctor, there's a heart doctor, there's this and there's that. And finally, my GI team sent me to Dr. Lacerda and the IU team that are liver transplant surgeons. I told the good doctor, I says, whatever you do, don't use that C word on me. We didn't until we got a permanent, full-time, guaranteed diagnosis of a cancer within my liver. I did the radiation implant, got that done, followed and jumped through all the hoops that that binder had in it, every doctor's visit, quickly because we were not going to deal with that C word anymore. I was placed on, got full approval to go on the transplant list in April, three years ago. June the 4th, three years ago, April, May, and June, on the 4th of June, the day after my birthday, the doctor's team called me and said, we have a good possibility. Are you interested? It took me about 30 minutes to get a shower and get to the hospital. <laughs> Not without complications after the procedure. There were. But with the help of that family, that family of mine, and the help of that team, I did it. And liver issues are no longer a problem. Um, I even quit using alcohol in my mouthwash. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's gone. I don't take NyQuil anymore. Uh, my first day at the hospital with the sepsis, I know God brought me through that one. I have no doubt. And I have no doubt that God brought me through this one. And all I'd like to do is to help anyone in this situation to make a positive decision for their life. Make sure you've got your family a support team. Well, let me follow on that, Connie. What would you say to others who are considering participating in the kind of research that you participated in with Dr. Nephew? Oh, with the um, group sessions in the evenings. Those were so much fun. I learned so much. Um, I'd been pretty isolated. My daughter's a great protector. Um, I'd been pretty isolated and in my own little cocoon, but to be able to come out and share with others and to investigate what I had missed mm -hmm. in my preparation um, things that might help somebody else even more great it was 100 percent worth every second it's wonderful thank you we have a question from the audience yes hi i'm a very compelling story and just enjoy hearing all that you had to undergo I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I know it's a miracle that you are here Thank based you. on sepsis and septic shock and all the organs that you involve. But my question, and this may be for the rest of the panel too, but more to you, would you have had such a successful outcome if you didn't have a strong family support? I, from a health disparity standpoint, I wonder about patients who may not have any family 
does that make them uh, have a lower outcome because they don't have the family? They may have the team, medical team, but that family support. What do you think? I think that was pivotal in my success. Mm -hmm. um, it would not have had to have been my daughter and my immediate family. It could be a family that, that you create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are what we call fictive kin. Virginia, is that you? Yes, it is I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of our great heroines in the state of Indiana, Virginia Kane. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else with a question? Or Dr. Nephew, would you'd like to end us uh, off with this? Oh, we got one over here? Okay, great. Titus, let's do it. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Lauren, it's always great to hear your story. Um, I have the following question. So uh, you mapped your journey through health disparities research from, you know, detecting to intervening and finally making a difference. My question is, how can we, what do you see as points where we can accelerate this? Because, you know, you chronicled a multi-year journey through this topic, and we see so much disparity in our daily lives, and it comes out sometimes in very crass and shocking ways. How can we get faster? That's a, a really wonderful question. Um, I kind of outlined a, a process. You're right, it took several years, but I think that there's lessons that were already known in other diseases, but in order to be funded, you have to prove it in your disease. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And a lot of people thought that I jumped to an intervention way too soon. My K-23 was an intervention, which is not usually what people do. But I was tired of describing disparities over and over again. And I didn't want to spend five years doing more descriptive work. And so I think the NIMHD was really, that's the National Institute for Minority Health Disparities, were really open to a intervention in an earlier stage than some un, some other institutes may have been because they realize what you're saying and so they really put out rfas they want to see interventions they don't want to see descriptive disparities work and i think the other institutes need to get on board we don't need to keep describing the determinants the mm -hmm. determinants are the determinants yep. do something pragmatic if it doesn't work do something different um and so i think that we need more institutes to get on board with that my k was um, not the NCI didn't like my K. Um, and so I had to retool it for NIMHD a bit and they loved it. And so I think, again, the institutes have to get on board that we, we can't spend 10 years, you know, enrolling 500 patients to describe their determinants. Like, I mean, I think we've got to take some lessons from breast cancer, from colon cancer, and try some things out. Um, and see how they work. That would be my thoughts, but you know, I don't run the institutes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday though, Lauren, we can, we can count on you to do that, right? Bring that wisdom. Well, thank you, Lauren and Connie, for I, I think what is really pioneering collaborative research. So uh, we need to move on to our next um, speaker.